Shall we begin? Why not? Welcome to Frankie Sense and More. It's like she's got a whole lot of goodness for you with a little bit of sass. Frankie, did you just say... She sure did. Not to mention, <laughs> along with... <laughs> Whoops. Join us now as Frankie Picasso and her new co-host mix it up with authors, musicians, and interviews with world-changing people. Let's begin, bro. Okay, let's begin now, because it only makes sense. Well, hello there. How are you today? You have reached Frankie Sense and More. I forgot what show I was doing today. It's Thursday. It's got to be Frankie Sense and More. Uh, today, I have three amazing guests to look forward to. We have author Janice Contori. We have Matt and Corey from the Earth Group. They're also going to be in the house shortly. And as you know, this show is always aligned with the UN Global Goals. We haven't talked about them for a little bit. But if you don't know anything about them, please visit www.globalgoals.com and help make them a reality. You know, last week on my show, Mission Unstoppable, I interviewed the world-renowned psychic Elizabeth Joyce. On September the 1st, Elizabeth made some profound predictions. And yesterday she called me, uh, said, Frankie, you have to write this article for the Huffington Post for me. You have to tell everyone about my predictions for Hurricane Irma, among other things. And I'm going to share more later in the show. But for right now, if you are in Florida, especially Miami, please get out now. Miami will be totally submerged underwater and may not ever recover. The Trump Tower uh, Hotel will find itself 10 feet underwater, and she's very worried about the lives of the residents, so please heed her warning. And whether you believe in psychics or not, safe is always better than dead, I say. So do it, and you can always have a laugh about it later if things turn out differently. I'm going to welcome Janice Contori. She's with us. She's a retired uh, law enforcement professional. She is from Long Beach, California, where she served for over 22 years. And I think that this experience translated into very believable storylines in, I think she's got 10 books I'm going to ask her. Uh, definitely works for her because she has now published all of these books, as I said. Uh, the latest book I read was Crisis Shot. Welcome, Janice. Let's have a, let's have a chat about you and your books. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate you being, being here. You know, I, it's kind of a tough time to be a police officer right now, isn't it? A little scary. Yeah, it is. It is. I um, I'm so glad I'm not. <laughs> yeah. I, I pray often because I can't imagine. I mean, I thought we dealt with some tough issues, but it just seems all compounded now, especially with social media and everybody's a critic and everybody has a camera and. Yeah, it's very Yeah, scary. you know, and it's it's interesting you said that you're glad that you got out because I have a daughter just entering. And, you know, we're in Canada, uh, a little bit different, but not a whole lot. Um, yeah. You know, it, certainly more diversity maybe than, than in a lot of other places. But it is a little scary to think that uh, because you wear blue, you're a target. You know, it used yes. to be people revered you and thought, oh, good, I can go to a police officer. They're going to help me. And, and people, you know, just don't have that same feeling anymore. But what I love about your books is that they all feature the main characters, a strong woman mm -hmm. who can take care of herself and others and get the job done. And you don't find that very often. No. And, and you know, in my um, experience in law enforcement, um, I really never saw, had an issue um, with guys you know, giving me a hard time for being a woman. I, I was always, I always felt on equal footing. Oh, that's so, good. So it allows me with, you know, and I know women before me have different stories. So yeah. I would just say that. But when I came on, I totally felt like, I mean, there might've been one or two older guys that were difficult, but overall, I always felt on equal footing. So when I write my characters, that's where I'm, my mindset is. They're on equal footing. There's no difference. And they just need to do the job, period. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because like 22 years ago, you know, I, I'm surprised that you're saying that. I've had a few ladies on who also, um, you know, were law enforcement or military professionals. But they... Um, you know, their story is a little different that, you know, they had to be real hard ass, that they had to really prove themselves in this man's world that, you know, guys uh, still looked at them as sexual objects. And, and they it was, a you know, they almost had to become more butch to just to uh, or, or disguise their femininity rather than just be themselves. 
You, you know, and I heard those stories too. I can tell you, I worked with women. I I worked with a woman who was the first um, female on the canine squad, and she ended up suing the department for sexual harassment. Um, but I never, like, just my personal experience, um, as long as you were in there, you did what you were supposed to do, you did your job, and you didn't whine about it, or you didn't, I, I didn't have any issues. And I'm not saying she whined about it. I don't, I don't know her situation. Yeah, either. yeah. You know, yeah. so I understand. I have heard those stories. I can only speak to what I dealt with myself. I actually had more issues. Um, the biggest issue I can think of in when I went, when I was working concerning being a woman, mm-hmm. happened with someone I stopped. Um, oh. You know, he was, I had a male partner at that particular time. And he was all over me, calling me different kind of names and so on and so forth. I had absolutely no respect for me. So I generally dealt with that more for people that I had contact with rather than the people I worked with. The people I worked with, I always felt like it was family. We were brothers and sisters in blue. And so, I still feel that way. And, and your partner, like when he heard somebody calling you names or, you know, you're a bitch or whatever, would he, did he get into macho mode and go, hey, buddy, that's a woman? Or was it just like you're another guy? Or another police officer. Right, we were just partners. I wouldn't yeah. have wanted him to do that. He's was my big brother. Yeah, it yeah. Well, that's by me. Think... Like that big brother mode comes out sometimes because they feel, you know, you're a girl and and you need to be protected. But he respected that you could look after yourself. Yes, he did. That's and, awesome. Uh, and I respected that too. So. Now I think I read that you always wanted to be a writer, but didn't have anything to write. And so when you retired, you had lots to write about. Exactly. Yeah, I always wanted to be a writer. My father didn't really encourage it because he didn't think I could make a living. <laughs> so I pursued, I pursued other avenues. And when I became a police officer, it was um, it was the Rodney King riots. It was experiencing oh, wow. that on street level that really made me, you know, I had to journal and I had to write after that. And I decided, you know what, I have a lot here. I can write stories. I can write good books. Yeah, yeah. And, and you do write. You write really well. So did you take a writing class at all in college or? I did. I took creative writing in college, but it wasn't until later when I finally decided to, um, to seriously write that I started attending writers conferences. I think writers conferences is where I learned the most and, and got, oh, neat. got the biggest head start. Yeah. So, I mean, how many hours a day do you sit and write? You know, it depends. Um, I'm a morning person, so if I get up, go to the gym, and sit down and write, I'm probably good till noon. Wow, that's awesome. Then then other things always come up. Of course. I have to to do it in the morning. I have to be here in the morning. I'm the same as you. I'm a writer, a morning writer. Did um, (laughs) One of of the things uh, I'm curious about, because a, a few of the female writers that I have had on uh, who also wrote, uh, you know, kind of in that same genre as you. You guys all use Oregon <laughs> for, for, your, for your psychos. Like, what is it about Oregon, moving to Oregon or being in Oregon that is so attractive um, as a place to set your story? Well, you know, I moved here four years ago. I moved oh, to you did? Okay. And um, it had always been a dream of mine to live in a, a quieter place, a less populated area, especially after working in Long Beach. Long Beach is, I think, the fourth largest city in Southern California. So, And it just runs right into L.A. So it's kind of a big area, very congested. And I'd always wanted to move to a smaller town. And, and that's what I did four years ago. So my character transition, this was the first book where it's a full transition into Oregon. So Okay. So you're actually living in a, in a town similar to the one that you wrote about in Crisis Shot? Pretty much, yeah. Small town, 5,000, population 5,000, um, yeah. And how were you received? You know, I – very well. I did a book signing at the local bookstore down here um, for the last book, not for this book. And it went over really well. I saw a lot of people. I We sold a lot of books. I talked to a couple of girls, which was really little girls, like 9 and 10 years old, oh, nice. who wanted to be writers. And that was the most fun. That was more fun than even writing the books, was being able to encourage them that they could go out and do the same thing if that's what their dream was. So, yeah, very Good well. You. Yeah, nothing like inspiring others, right? <laughs> well, Let's talk yeah. about it. 
I'm sorry. They have ahead. such hopes, you know, for me at that age, it was horse books, you know. Yeah, me too, me too. <laughs> Yeah, what is it about us girls who love our horses? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Crisis Shot, great book. Couldn't put it down. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's 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 a, a woman in charge. You know, was leading a, a what was she a, a lieutenant or something? And what was she in Long Beach? She Sorry. was a command, she was a commander in Long Beach. Commander. Yeah. And and there was a shooting that she. Um, you know, she had to shoot somebody on the street, and of course, with all the stuff going on, it's like, oh my God, you shot somebody, and you, you know, they were, you shouldn't have shot them, and uh, so, so she was kind of followed. This, this negativity followed her uh, to a new position in Oregon, where she became. Uh, she wasn't a sheriff, was she? A no, sheriff? she was the chief of a small chief department. Of a small she, department, but she worked for the sheriff. Yeah, yeah, um, she worked from another area, and you know, so this is her story, and about being accepted, and about. Uh, proving to this town that you know she could do the job and d herself and people were a little afraid because they thought she would might have been trigger happy uh, but a really really good story solid story now how many of the stories that you write about came out of your your little black book the well, one that you know you guys take notes in <laughs> yeah there's nothing um there's just little bits and pieces like um I will always fall back on the procedures that I learned as a police officer when I'm writing a police officer. Right. So in terms of the rules for the job and the way that they approach things, the way that they stop people and, you know, that kind of stuff always falls back on what I learned. And occasionally um, I'll bring stuff up uh, like one of the most horrific things that I ever had to deal with when I was working was a, I went, responded to a call where a, um, a seven-year-old boy had shot and killed his two-year-old half-brother. Oh, no. Oh, and Janice, we're going to hold that thought because we do have to go to commercial break. Okay. Uh, cliffhanger. Oh, my God. What's going to happen? Um, <laughs> but uh, when we come back, we we'll carry on with that. And I think Matt and Corey are also with us. So we'll say hi to them right now before I go to commercial. Hi, guys. Hey, how you doing? We're doing good. Thank you. And we're going to go to commercial right now. When we get back, we will talk to a little bit more with Janice, and we're going to talk to the boys about the Earth Group. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back on Frankie Sense and more. Heck no. We're just getting warmed up. Frankie Sense and more will be right back after we pay the bills. butt dialed someone accidentally according to a report for every 100 calls made to 911 this year about 40 were dialed unintentionally recently a mother in canada called police after receiving a nightmarish cell phone call from her daughter filled with blood chilling screams and a man shouting murderous threats police discovered that the girl was at a movie theater in victoria Anticipating the worst, the cops were preparing to descend on the cinema when a dispatcher tried calling the girl's cell phone one last time. The girl answered her phone and explained she was not being attacked by a murderer, but was watching the horror film Cabin in the Woods. What do you call the activity of being impolite in a social situation by looking at your phone instead of paying attention to the person you are with? Fubbing. It's marching day. I'm Carolyn Davidson, and you can have fun challenging your words you never heard vocabulary with my free app, Too Funny for Words. It's the Fitness Minute with fitness expert, Annette Hammond. Tabata workouts are all the rage right now, but are they the right workout for you? Named after Japanese scientist Tabata, these high-intensity interval workouts can be completed in four minutes. Any exercise can be incorporated into the Tabata training, whether aerobic or weights. The basic outline of the Tabata training method is 20 seconds of intense training followed by 10 seconds of rest. There is a total of 8 sessions or rounds. Shape Magazine says it can increase your aerobic capacity, your anaerobic capacity, VO2 max, resting metabolic rate, and can help you burn more fat than a traditional 60-minute aerobic workout. That's right! They claim that four minutes of Tabata can get you better fitness gains than an entire hour of running on the treadmill. It may be worth a try. For the Fitness Minute, I'm Annette Hammond. And it's Frankie Sensenmore. I am your host, Frankie Picasso. I'm speaking to author Janice Contori. And coming up next, we have Matt Moreau and uh, Corey Chilebeck from The Earth Group. Also... 
Uh, what was I going to tell you? I can't remember, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> It'll come back to me. Janice, just before we went to break, you were telling us about a herring uh, call that you that you had to go out to as a police officer. You said it was a seven-year-old who had shot his two-year-old half-brother? Yes, yes. He, um, he actually climbed up. He, he knew where his father kept the gun. He climbed. He put a chair on the bed, climbed way up, got the gun, and ended up shooting his brother. Um, it, it was horrific. It was a horrific um, thing to deal with. I sat with the boy. Um, at first, he, he tried to tell us that some men had broken in the house and shot his brother, but it was obviously not the truth. Mm-hmm. And so I sat with him for quite a while until we got him to tell the truth. But where I was going with that was that kind of experience is always going to be in the background of my characters. So, yeah. So that, so that when I draw from my work experience, I draw from how I did it. And then, and then it's all mashed out into the character, those, those kinds of things. So not specifically, I don't specifically write about stuff that happened. in. Long yeah. Time. Yeah. The procedural and what you might've done and said to somebody. So did this seven year old, he intentionally shot his brother or he just wanted to play with the gun and it went off or. You know, the, no, the, well, the impression we got, was that he, there was a lot, quite a bit of sibling rivalry. His mother Uh, was a single mom, and he had been the center of her life until she got married. And then when she had the little, the second child, all of a sudden he was not, no longer the most important one. And so the impression we got was, yeah, he did intentionally shoot the child. Now, whether he really understood the ramifications. Right. You know what I'm saying? He didn't, he didn't fully understand what was going to happen if he did that. So right. Yeah. That was a hard thing. It was a really, really hard thing. Wow. I'm sorry you had to deal with that. And I'm sorry, you know, that family had to deal with that. But, you know, good thing that there are people like you who go out on those calls. Now, you consider yourself a Christian author? I do. Yeah. And is, is, is that the kind of thing that would help you get through an evening after a call like that? Definitely. My faith um, always played a big role. Uh, it played a big role in how I treated people. It played a big role in you know, just really thinking about the impact on like that kind of incident on the family down the road. Yeah. And so yeah, it really did. Wow. That's pretty, pretty crazy, pretty crazy stuff. I'm going to um, say, hold, hang on there, Janice, please. I'm going to introduce Matt and, and Corey. Matt Moreau and, and Corey Chilibeck are partners in a venture that they call the Earth Group. And I would say with hearts as big as the province they come from, these two Canadian socialpreneurs, and it's rare I have Canadians on, uh, founded a social enterprise that exists solely to provide food, water, and education to children globally. And through a worldwide agreement they have with the United Nations World Food Program, they donate 100% of their profits to the World Food Program to fund school meal programs. Wowzer guys, like you take everyday items that we use, like tea, coffee, and water, and allow us consumers a way to spend our dollars way more wisely than we than we probably would have um how on earth did you guys come up with this idea where did you meet let's start back where did you guys meet uh, we actually met um we were both in school at a ski shop we worked at a ski shop together in edmonton called skier sport shop and we were both uh technicians in the back uh, like waxing skis and adjusting bindings and things like that and uh that's where we that's the first place we met and so you were you became buddies and you started to travel together. Well, it was actually actually it was probably the year before I met Matt. Actually, I was uh, I grew up in Edmonton, which is if anybody's unfamiliar with Edmonton, it's an awesome city to grow up in. It's a pretty cool place. Um, I never needed anything or wanted anything. You know, went on family ski trips, played hockey, um, sort of lived a, a good lifestyle, and didn't realize that ninety nine point nine percent of the world didn't live that same lifestyle that I did. I was sort of a you know the quintessential spoiled Canadian kid, right? Right. Um, and, my, and in my second year of university, I took some time off and sort of went on my first, you know, uh, trip, you know, outside of like Disneyland and ski trips with the family. And I spent uh, a month and a half in Nepal, uh, oh. amongst other countries. But uh, I was actually on a Mount Everest base camp expedition, and we were about two days below base camp at like 21,000 feet. And I was dressed like your typical North American tourist with my North Face down outfit on going up towards base yeah. camp. And we passed an old man on the trail going the same direction as us. And he had this enormous basket on his back, just huge. 
And through our interpreter, we talked to this guy for like a minute. And he had no shoes on, so he was barefoot. And we're, remember, it's, it's minus 20. We're up at 21,000 feet. It's, you know, it's cold. It's rocky. He's always barefoot, no jacket, no gloves, no hat, just like ripped pants and a ripped shirt, this enormous basket. And he was getting paid 25 cents U.S. a day to carry this basket. And we asked him what it was he was carrying. And uh, it turned out it was just cans and cans and cans of Coca-Cola. So at that point, I realized, you know, either directly or indirectly, some of the biggest companies in the world were making money literally off the backs of some of the poorest people on the planet. So kind of came back home and started thinking, like, you know, why couldn't you have a company that compete with the biggest companies in the world, uh, have a great product, you know, produce it responsibly and ethically, but at the end of the day, we would give everything we made back to people who really needed it. And that's sort of where the, the original idea for the company came. And Matt and I met, uh, you know, I started the company basically with an old van and a laptop, and Matt and I met about a year later. And uh, he joined into the company, and uh, we never looked back. That's incredible. And can I ask, you guys are what, in your 30s or late 20s? Yeah, 30s. <laughs> You're in your 30s. I'm more towards, that, I'm more towards the late side, and he's more towards the early side. Yeah. Uh, okay. And, and congratulations to Matt because he just got married. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. She did her research. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um and, you know, there's a, there, I, I interviewed another Canadian who ha, operates a school in Nepal that kind of is similar in a way where, you know, they educate the children and then the kids who graduate come back and pay for another child to go through school after they finish college. So, it's, it, you know, it's this kind of sustainable system that, you know, where they, they help one another. But I love what you guys are doing. You really only have three products. You have coffee, tea and water. But, you know, yeah. you have so – wow, you know. But so far, like, I think if your website is accurate, you, you've already um, given out 150,000 meals. Yeah, actually, that's uh, our website. We haven't updated in a, in a little bit here. We're about to make another donation in three, uh, three months here. And at that point, we'll be approaching 3 million meals provided. Isn't that amazing? We've had the last Isn't couple that... years it's been tremendous growth for us. We've been able to double our donation to the UN. Uh, basically, every time we talk to them and meet with them, we've got exciting news. And all we want to do is keep sharing our story and keep finding more ways to raise money for the incredible work that they do. I mean, like you, you sell fair trade organic coffee. You know, everybody wants that. You sell it for about fifteen ninety nine Canadian. And when I purchased that. That's five school meals for a child. That's so exactly a child it. will eat at school and go to school for a whole week because I bought that coffee. How amazing is that? We think it's pretty awesome. Yeah, I mean, we, we really try to attach something tangible to, you know, that bag of coffee or that box of tea. So as a consumer, you know, if you've had a busy day and you haven't been able to, to help your local or international community, uh, say you don't have the time or the money to donate, whatever it is, the only thing that you've done in a day is buy a bag of Earth coffee and, you know, brew your Earth coffee in the morning before you headed out for work. And you, you've helped someone. You've helped create hope and you've helped create a future for a child who needs it most somewhere in the world. And I love that the idea that, you know, these school meals – are incentives for kids to go to school because otherwise they wouldn't have something to eat. And, and so, you know, you go to school, you know, your tummy's going to be full anyway, even if you don't want to go. Um, but it helps break that cycle of, of poverty. And that, that's really awesome. I know, you know, uh, you're not the first to think of it, but it's certainly, you know, with your products, it's, it's pretty amazing. How many countries um, are you working in right now? Right now, we're probably got projects going in two or three at the moment, but we've done uh, projects in probably eight or nine uh, since we started. And uh, with all of our projects, um, the kids get uh, free education, uh, food, and clean, safe wa drinking water. And if you're actually a girl, we give you food to take home at the end of the day. So we're essentially bribing the families to send the girls to school because mm -hmm. it's mainly the case that girls do not go to school in these, these places that we operate in. Yeah, usually working, yeah. working, you know, fetching firewood, cooking, things like that. So well, the research is very clear that if the girls are educated in the community, it just changes everything. So it's one of sort of our pillars of our projects is that we focus on making sure girls are going to school as well. Um, and we found this that. is very, very, very effective and very easy uh, way to have uh, the family send the girls to school as well. I, yeah, I don't know if you were if you were able to hear the beginning of the show, but you know the show is is aligned with the United Nations Global Goals, and so one of those global goals is to make sure that girls go to school, and to make sure that you know we end hunger, and you know before 2030 for sure, and hopefully by 2019. So you guys are well on your way to helping that happen, and that's really yeah, exciting. We believe that like our model, if we want to like sort of look at the big picture, 
I mean, we're a very small company in Canada, you know, run out of a very small location here in Edmonton, but we're growing. But the reality is, is that it costs about 30 billion U.S. dollars a year to solve world hunger, which seems like a tremendous amount of money. However, if like, for instance, if everybody who lived in a G7 country, Canada being a G7 country, the same with the United right. States, if everybody bought in one year 20 bags of our coffee, let's say everybody bought 20 bags in an entire year, we would end global hunger. That would be it. We could nail it. So yeah. it's possible. So if there's other companies doing what we did or we had more products or if we're able to grow, I mean, that's what our goal is. Like we want to get to the point where people are talking about like we're close to ending global hunger. Like this is something that hopefully in 20 years people will be like, remember when we had global hunger? That was terrible. So now it's gone. You know, like that's what we want to get yeah. to. And that's all, being achieved that. because, that's all being achieved because the consumer is saying, you know, I can buy this product versus the other. I'm so aware of where my money is going, which is it's happening in today's economy. So we're trying to tap into that and, again, you know, change the world through that. And you guys just made a deal. You, you have your water in IKEA. Yeah, we're in every IKEA across Canada um, exclusively, and we're hoping that we'll be in the uh, United States soon, and uh, some of the other places in the world we're, we're talking with as well. So that's uh, that's a big one. And if you're uh, in Eastern Canada, we just did a deal with all the Sobies in Eastern Canada, so you'll see Earth Water and Coffee coming to Sobies there any day. Oh, great! And and so you get um, a percentage, I guess, or the whole. Shebang, I guess, whatever it is, the deals that you make. So if I if I go to IKEA and I get my water, then I know that that what's going to happen. Yeah, exactly. And the stores we work with, I mean, they they believe in what we're doing too, and they want to be a part of the story. Um, but the reality is, they all make money on our products, just like any other product. We're not asking them to like cut their margins or do- right. donate as well. They're big businesses owned by hundreds and thousands of shareholders. So what we've done is offer them a competitive product that sells, where they can make the same margin they can on everything else. But it has right. an amazing story, and it helps people. So it's a win-win for them, too. They, they want to make some money, but they also want to change the world as well. So we, we're really excited to be aligned with places like Sobeys, Ikea, and London Drugs, for instance, uh, who believe in what we're trying to do, and, and they're helping us along instead of just selling your Coke and Nestle products like most stores do. That's right. We're going to go to commercial break, and when we come back, I'm going to talk to Matt and Corey a little bit more. Janice, if you have any questions for the guys, you know um, – Get them ready because I definitely want to, to have your input here. Um, I guess the, the, the one question that everybody is um, has on their mind, I would think, and don't answer it because we're going to go commercial, is how do you guys survive and live on and eat yourselves? <laughs> but we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. It's Frankie Sense more. I'm your host, Frankie Picasso. We're speaking to, to Matt and Corey from the Earth Group. Warmed up. Frankie Sense and more. We'll be right back after we pay the bills. One evening in 1929, William Lear and Elmer Wavering of Quincy, Illinois, were out driving with their girlfriends. One of the girls suggested it would be even more romantic if they could listen to music. The guys liked the idea and started tinkering with installing a home radio in the car. They sold their idea to a radio manufacturing company and applied for a loan with a local banker to get production started. Thinking it might sweeten the deal, they installed one of their new radios in the banker's vehicle. Unfortunately, the banker's car caught on fire, and they didn't get the loan. They must have felt like Dunder Klumpens. Not giving up, they drove to a radio convention and sat outside in the car with the radio blasting. Soon, orders were pouring in and taking a cue from the Victrola because their radio was going in a car. They called it the Motorola. It's words you never heard. I'm Carolyn Davidson, and you can have fun challenging your words you never heard vocabulary with my free app, Too Funny for Words. It's the Fitness Minute with fitness expert, Annette Hammond. Ignoring joint pain will not make it go away, nor will avoiding motions that are uncomfortable and spark discomfort. Harvard Medical School states that the secret to joint pain relief is exercise. Doing the right exercises on a continuous basis can relieve pain and might even permit you to postpone or avoid surgery on a problem joint. But the benefits don't stop there. Being active sharpens your mind and benefits your heart. Harvard says that it nudges your blood pressure down and your morale up, eases stress, and shaves off unwanted pounds. But most importantly, it lessens your risk of dying prematurely. So what are you waiting for? Exercise helps relieve joint pain and so much more. Pain-free movement and a fabulous quality of life await you. For the Fitness Minute... I'm Annette Hammond. Oh, 
Okay, and we're back. Thanks so much for sticking around. I really appreciate it. We're talking to Matt and Corey from the Earth Group, and you can go to the earthgroup.com. That's their website. Check out their products. Uh, the water that you guys sell um, in Canada, it's from, I guess, a glacier in Alberta, but in around the world, it's it's wherever the best water source is. Is that how it's it's working out? Yeah, really, we just try to find a, kind of, you know, a, a source that's close to our market. So um, in Europe, we can bottle in, in the Netherlands, and that just means that we're not shipping water all across the planet. Um, we're not a better tasting, sparkling flavored water from the Swiss Alps or anything like that. It's just at the end of the day, the closest that we can get it to our market, uh, the, mm-hmm. the least we spend on shipping and the smaller our carbon footprint is. Awesome. Perfect. Um, so I was, I was, you know, I left with that little cliffhanger. You give all your money away. How do you make money when you give all your money away? How do you how do you eat? How are you going to support that wife of yours? <laughs> we have we have really understanding fiancés and wives now, so that, <laughs> that, that helps. Um, you know what the reality is for we haven't taken a salary out of this company since we started. So both Matt and I have second jobs that uh, suck that we do, um, but we have second jobs that help uh, pay the rent and allow us to eat. It uh, turns out that, you know, every time we hire someone, we got to pay everybody else first besides us. So, of course. Um, so we, keep, we keep growing the company because we get so excited about it and want to keep seeing what we can do. So we keep doing that instead of paying ourselves. But the, the real goal is that we want to eventually pay ourselves. So the way that the model works is we give 100% of our net profits globally from sales to the World Food Program. But what we do is we plan it a year in advance. So, oh, okay. you know, last year we gave out uh, 500,000 school meals. So we know approximately how much that's going to cost us. So we build that into our, our business model. So we know we're going to provide half a million meals. Um, anything above that, maybe we can hire someone, expand into a new market, do some marketing, you know, launch a new product, and keep getting bigger and better so we can always, every year, donate more money. So it's sort of how we, we build the model around the company. Uh, we've always wanted to pay ourselves so we could focus on the company more, and that's, that is truly our goal one day is that we're able to do that. But up until now, uh, we haven't been able to do that. <laughs> to be honest, but uh, that's, that's just pretty much the going. entrepreneurial way. <laughs> yeah, it's not. But tell me, tell me how, 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 awesome. how is this growing? How are you growing this? I mean, okay, you got into Sobeys, you got an IKEA, um, but how can like Jana's get in on this? Does she have to order it from your website, or is, are you going to bring it to the states? Um, how can all of us help? I mean, could, could her church group help? Like, how can we um, further your this experience and feed more kids and send them mm-hmm. to school? Yeah, it's funny you mention that because all, all those things that you say, they work. They fit in our model. So church groups, we've got a ton of those in Western Canada here that order our product or do little fundraisers for us, and then we just pass that money right through to the UN, and they can go feed an extra ten or 20,000 kids. Um, our website, which is actually earthgroup.org, we've got an online oh, store there. And, no, that's fine. It, it's really, really picking up. Um, people following us on social media, our handle is at the Earth Group. And, you know, the, the online sales, I mean, again, it's, I order my coffee from earthgroup.org and I've just fed a kid for a week rather than going to the grocery store. Um, but really, you know, in your local community, it comes down to walking in and, okay, if the product isn't there at the, the mom and pop grocery store, you know, take five minutes to, to talk to the grocery manager and say, hey, have you heard of this product? Have you heard of these guys and their story? And see if they may pick, might pick us up because, the reality is we can spend as much time as we want calling these guys, but they're, you know, grocery managers are so busy, they don't sure. have time to take our calls. But as soon as a customer comes in and says, I'd like to see this product on the shelf, and as soon as they get a couple of those in, you know, in a week or two, all of a sudden that product's going to be there, and then we've got one more store, and you know, all that just accumulates towards us getting towards feeding a million kids a year. Yeah, I mean, you know what would be really, I'm, I, I got my entrepreneur hat on right now, and it's not like you haven't thought of this, I'm sure. But if you got into, like, all all the sports facilities, the Sky Domes and the, you know, all the big ones where you've got, we love you that. know, the football we love and the, all of that, like, that would be awesome. Yeah, it's, those are difficult, and we've been trying to get into I those know. places. The, the reality yeah. is that, like, the, the Cokes of the world, mostly Coke and Pepsi, have, like, these exclusivity contracts with, like, Cities, like the city of Edmonton, for instance, it's very disappointing that the city of Edmonton has an exclusivity with Coca-Cola at all the city of Edmonton facilities. So it's an American company that has the exclusive right to provide beverages to every facility, name at the University of Alberta, where I went to school. You know, yeah. it's where it restricts our access to the market. We can't even bid on a, on a you know, to, to sell our products there. We get kicked out immediately and no one will talk to us. So it's really difficult to go up against those big companies that are able to yeah. do Something like that, which in most parts of the world is actually illegal, but in North America, it seems to fly pretty well here. Um, yeah, especially but, overcharge for it, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they overcharge you know, I love, for it. I love that you can go to Costco and get water for 25 cents, and you go to the Sky Dome, and you buy, you know, buy a bottle for five bucks. 
like, oh, actually, we, we actually talked to small like store owners on, on university campuses, and they're like, "We'd love to buy your water because we have to buy Dasani for a dollar fifty when we can get it for fifty cents at Costco." But we have to buy Coke products; it's just part of the rules here, right? So, yeah, um, they're able to have these exclusivity arrangements, and there's no room for for local products or products of the story or anything else. Anybody that doesn't have the money up front to be able to to buy those rights, so it's, it can be a challenge for us for sure. Janice. Um... I, I know that you know you're in Oregon now, living in a small town, but uh, Houston's not that far away. And you know, I, I hear stories of, about people overcharging for water. Like, I, I think it was like forty dollars a case or something crazy, um, which I think is supposed to be illegal. Uh, have, have you heard? You know, have you seen things like that happening? You know, I haven't. Um, I've been watching. Actually, I've been paying attention to what the first responders are doing, and I haven't heard. Um, and just watching the rescues and watching the people talk about on talk about hearts, you know, people coming from far away with their boats to help pull people yeah. out of the water. That was really awesome. It you know, was but great listening, to see. listening to them talk about, you know, making sure girls um, go to school and this, that, and the other thing. That is that is like so awesome. One of the things I I always tend to look at things from a law enforcement perspective, and my wish would be someday to have a world where girls are free from sex trafficking. Yes. Um, because it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem here. It's a huge problem all over the world. And, yes. and like world hunger, I mean, this drive, this sick drive to traffic young girls, it really has to end. I totally agree. And I have a book coming out with 21, with 20 other authors in, in October. And, and we started a global foundation along with that book. And one of the, you know, the things is that the money from the proceeds of that book will go to stop sex trade because, you know, freedom for, for us is, is a huge ideal. And, you know, the three of us, the four of us on this call right now um, are afforded a lot of freedoms that most people in the world will never have. And, you know, like the freedom to go to school, the freedom to speak your mind, the freedom to wear the clothes that you want, the freedom to marry who you want, the freedom, you know, all of these freedoms uh, are are negated in a lot of a lot of the places in the world. And, you know, when you look at Thrive um, in they did a, um, a study on on women in, in third world countries, women who make or who might have maybe a dollar or two dollars uh, a day to feed their families on. And if, if it wasn't for those women, like being so creative and, you know, uh, selfless, their families would go hungry. And, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, what you guys are, are doing is, is phenomenal. And I have done a number of shows actually on, on sex trade in the United States, and um, I'm sure I'll do some more, but, that is um, a big problem along, you know, even, and, and female, you know, mutilation is another one that's mm -hmm. kind of high on my list, but uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy, pretty crazy what's yeah. happening out there. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, Have you guys... we spent a lot of time talking with the world, with the United Nations and World Food Program about those types of, uh, you know, those issues. And they say that the, and I agree with them, the biggest equalizer and the biggest, you know, way to end most of those problems is actually through education, just uh, bringing people out of poverty. Because uh, mo almost all those problem problems are pretty exclusive to places with, you know, a lot of pro poverty. So if you can lift particularly females out of that poverty cycle, it tends to end or at least alleviate a lot of those problems very quickly. For sure. Yeah, you yeah. know, I, I I just watched a documentary. Um, geez, I wish I could remember the name of it. But it, it was a, a doctor um, or a guy from uh, New Jersey, an Indian, East Indian, uh, but American East Indian, who went back to India, opened up a school where in a, in a home, I guess you would call it, he got from the poorest of the poor in the class system, he would get these kids at the age of about three and four and bring them through the education system. They lived with him. They got to go home on weekends, but they would live with him, got university educated and, you know, broke the cycle of poverty in their families forever. It's phenomenal. Like, it's just an amazing life story that, you know, he dedicated, you know, the second half of his life to doing. And I think it's pretty extraordinary. I think that's what it takes is people to really care and do things like you guys really care and people ask me all the time um that's actually how the show got started because people will go well what can i do i'm just one person well look what one person can do right you know look what two people can do you can you know feed three million kids and make them go to school <laughs> you know that's and that's you know when you model that behavior or you go oh yeah that's really great maybe i can't do it myself but 
you know what, I'm going to call Matt and Corey and I'm going to see if I can't help them sell more coffee and water because I like the idea of, you know, these girls getting educated. Mm -hmm. So it's a win-win all the way around. You know, you listen and, 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 and pick up ideas or you just pick yourself up and you do it. It's, you know, I think it's pretty extraordinary. Um, but, you know, where you are, Janice, talk about first responders. You know, there's, there's the fires. There's the, the well, floods. The state of Oregon is burning. The state of Wyoming, and the state of Montana is on fire. Yeah, it's pretty. Um, That's horrific. It is horrific. In fact, right now I'm looking out at everything is in the smoke. We're covered in smoke here. Wow. We have about a month, and um, it's really, it's just really been bad. And is there any way that they can get a handle on this? Like, have they said? They said the middle of October because they're hoping it'll be raining in the middle of October. Oh, my God. And there's so much rain everywhere else around you except right where it's needed. Yeah. Yeah, it's been crazy. Have you guys had a lot of rain out, out west? Well, we did. We actually had a really we had a really wet winter. We really did. But Matt, Corey, tough. Edmonton raining? Did you uh, have a lot of water? Know. Oh, we've had it in the west. I mean, in western Canada, it's been horrible forest fires, too. We've needed rain. It's, uh, yeah. Dry. This is yeah, the wettest it's ever been here. Yeah, the only people that are happy right now are the farmers trying to do harvest right now because it's dry. But uh, if you go a little west of Edmonton, it's basically been a blanket of smoke all summer pretty much because of the giant fires up, up in northern British Columbia. Wow. I mean, it's crazy to think about all of this stuff. And it kind of, in a way, brings me back to the beginning of the show when I talked about um, Elizabeth's predictions uh, about what's going to happen in September. And, you know, there's a lot of people who are looking at these storms and the fires and they're talking about end of times. And, uh, you know, I just want to say from her perspective that it's not the end of times. It's just the end of, you know, a situation or an era or something. But it's not like, you know, um, the second coming is happening and and we're all going to go up to heaven right now or something. (laughs) It's not like that. It's not happening. No. I do want to talk a bit more about her predictions because they're pretty cool. Um, when we get back, we're going to go to another commercial break. Janice Contori is with us. Corey Chilibeck and Matt Moreau from the Earth Group are here. And, of course, I'm your host, Frankie Picasso. You're listening to Frankie Sense and More. Don't go anywhere because we love it when you stick around. Actually, if you want, you know, you can call us, 903-787-5887. We'd love to hear from you. If you want to hear uh, chat with anybody, 903-787-5887. No, we're just getting warmed up. Frankie Sense and more will be right back after we pay the bills. It's words you never heard. Got a lead foot? According to state troopers, here's what not to do when you get pulled over. Don't be a lachrymis and start crying right away. It doesn't help. But if you're under 20, crying won't be held against you. Don't ask for a break. Don't yell or start any argy-bargy. And one trooper said, if they're going to flirt with me to get out of a ticket, it would probably insult my intelligence. But unfortunately, I don't get hit on all that often. So flirting or being a gill flirt won't work. Did you know that 15% of all drivers get 76% of all traffic tickets? And the odds of winning if you challenge a traffic ticket in court are 1 in 3. So what should you do when you get pulled over for speeding? Be courteous to the officer, and most of all, be honest. It's words you never heard. I'm Carolyn Davidson, and you can have fun challenging your words you never heard vocabulary with my free app, Too Funny for Words. It's the Fitness Minute with fitness expert, Annette Hammond. That spare tire that many Americans carry around their middle is not only unsightly, it is also dangerous. Abdominal obesity increases your risk of stroke, heart attack, diabetes, and more. Some call it the middle-aged spread, or a beer belly, or muffin top. But the truth is, no matter what you call it, it is just fat. Harvard Medical School says that the culprit is calories. If you take in more calories in food and drink than you burn up with exercise, you'll store excess energy in fat cells. They state that the risk begins to mount at a waist size above 37 inches for men, and a measurement above 40 inches would put you in the danger zone. For women, the corresponding waist sizes are 31 and a half and 35 inches. Exercise is the key to shrinking that belly and dissolving the fat. 
I'm Annette Hammond. And we are back. We are back with Frankie Sentz and Warren. I was going to talk about Elizabeth Joyce's predictions, and she does has has texted me on on Skype and I don't know if she wants to come on or not but I'd be happy to have her come on if she wants to give us a call or uh, have Ben call you just let me know she's just typing back here um but we we certainly have some wonderful guests on with us right this moment in Janice Contori uh what's next for you Janice what's next you know you're going to write another book like you told me that you love the suspense genre who who is your idol by the way Oh wow! Um, Tess Gerritsen is one of my favorites. Her. Yeah. Do you like Gal- Lisa? Lisa? I'm sorry, Jack- Lisa Jackson. You know, I haven't read much of her, but um, David Balducci. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Michael Connelly is one of my favorites, and so is Robert Craze. Those are like my favorites. But right now, I'm working on book two, so Tess. Um, we'll be back in book two, and it'll be set entirely in my made-up town in Oregon. Oh, right. Nice. Do you guys, and you guys, um, you told me that, that you were going to order one of her books. Do you like suspense books? Is that something that you normally read? Yeah, I kind of like, uh, especially uh, in the evenings when you're trying to get your mind off of uh, the day. It's nice to have something like that just to take you to another place. So, yeah, I think uh, that'll be a, a, a genre I, I, I tend to like. And have you been to Oregon? You're pretty close to it. Yeah, we've been to uh, down to Portland a few times for um, trade shows, and uh, as we're sort of planning on uh, launching to the United States very soon, sort of the wash that uh, Washington, Portland, Northern California is sort of probably our first it would likely be our first foray, foray into the United States market. How do you think Colorado will take you? <laughs> I think they might uh, they might dig it. I mean, let's be honest. Edmonton is a uh, pretty, or Alberta can be a bit of a redneck, backwards place at times. Uh, I'm from here, so I have no problem saying it. It is true sometimes. Um, it, it is changing. So I think if it works here, um, it should work uh, just as well in Colorado as well, where it's sort of a similar maybe mindset, a little bit more agriculture based, a little more oil and gas. So I don't know. I, I think it, I think it'll work there. Very cool. I've been to Pikes Peak, and it was pretty cool there, and uh, I liked it. It was interesting. I think that, you know, hopefully, even, you know what, I mean, if it's you guys, and I hope that it is, or if it's, you know, anybody else who wants to help give money, you know, either way, it's wonderful, um, however however it's going to happen, right? Like, as, as far as people... Uh, you know, donating money and helping people, whatever it is around the world. So we hope that every, anybody who's listening, if you want to do, you know, your thing, do it. But, you know, definitely get on, uh, uh, get on, on, um, on the horn and get on your website and order the coffee, order the tea. Where do those teas come from? You've got interesting, interesting teas. Yeah, we actually grow the teas just about an hour and a half outside of Edmonton here. It's just an incredible family that grows it out in a beautiful garden. They don't actually allow any vehicles onto the site. So the tea is all picked by hand. It's harvested uh, kind of right around now. So we'll be going out to the farm pretty quick here to help out with that a bit. Um, but packaged out there on the farm. And, again, every box of tea that we sell feeds and educates the child for a week. <clears throat> Incredible. I love it. Um, we have Elizabeth Joyce, the um, that renowned psychic that I was talking to you about. She, she, I said that she typed me. And... Um, because she gave her prediction and she's really concerned about the citizens in Florida. And so we have her on now. Elizabeth, you're with us. I am. Hi, how are you? I'm okay. It's a little shaky though. I feel like I'm holding up 36 million lives. Oh my goodness. Well, Janice and Matt and Corey, please meet Elizabeth. They're our guests. She's, they're my guests today, Elizabeth. Um, but uh, yes, please tell us how can we help? We can pray. I know that. Well, I think that if you have friends in the area, you might want to really warn them. A lot of people are resisting evacuation, and they don't understand. They think that this is going to be like Andrew or Katrina, but these storms are really mustered up. They carry on the edge of them, which is not the eye, it's the outer edge, um, her... uh, 
cyclones and whirlpools and all kinds of things, which is what is ripping up the houses out of the roots and the trees. Mm -hmm. And it's so dangerous. We've never seen anything like it before. I think part of it, Frankie, is because of the new energy on the planet that really doesn't mess around. Mm -hmm. So, And part of it, of course, is what they're doing over in South Africa. But we really do need prayers and, and tell your friends to just get out. And you really see Miami totally immersed, right? Well, pretty much. Miami yeah. Beach, at least. And yeah. I'm part of Key West. I think it's going to go up the east side. But I see Donald Trump's house 10 feet underwater. Mar Largo. Yeah. Wow. And you also made some other predictions that I was going to tell everybody about. Well, I'll let you tell them about it. Because I think it's very interesting and, and kind of good news, really. Which ones? <laughs> <laughs> about some government leaders. Oh, that's going to happen in the middle of the month. You see, we had this eclipse that represents finalities and endings. So there will be many leaders around the world that will be removed and new people coming in. And, and the most exciting one is that the Queen will announce that Prince William will follow her, not Charles. And there's reasons for that. I think it's a main health reason. Okay. If do, uh, you guys have a question for Elizabeth, feel free to ask her, you know, about her predictions. Well, I guess we, did she do any predictions about uh, what's going up here in Canada? I guess we're, you know, we're kind of immune to what's going down in the States right now because we're not near this stuff. But, I mean, it's always nice to have a little heads up if something's happening. I will tell you something about Canada. Canada is pretty safe, and I'm going to tell you that many, many people will be coming into Canada to buy property and live because we're going to have to go up. The main, the main uh, states that will be populated in the U.S., in the next 20 years is going to be Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, New York State, and Montreal, and the Laurentians, and all through Toronto, and, and the areas around the West Coast as well. What about young Trudeau? Anything about our Prime Minister? Let me give me a second. He's... He's on thin ice. Is he on thin ice? I don't know anything about him. I think he is on thin ice. I, I'm feeling that he's on thin ice, and I'm feeling that there are three people around him that want to have the ice break under his feet, let me say it that way. So it's tenuous, and you'll see a change there, too. I'm not sure what. Mm -hmm. Wow. Interesting, interesting times. He said that, you know, September is a very interesting month with a lot of change, and so... Um, about it's faded. It's a faded month. That means it was planned a long time ago. Yeah, and and you know it'd be great to um, the situation in Korea would be great. You know, I think he's going to get taken out by his own people, either the South Koreans or the North Koreans. It's certainly better than us taking him out. Right, <laughs> and and still good news. <laughs> good news for the world, right there. Boy, that's pretty crazy stuff. Uh, Janice, I, I know that, you know, with your faith, I don't know what, how you feel about psychics, but Elizabeth has done uh, a lot of work with police departments in helping find missing people. Did you ever work with it? Janice is a former police officer uh, and now author. Did you ever work with, with a psychic in your police work? No, I never did. But um, in terms, my last series was on cold cases. And sometimes I wish that psychics could help people resolve cold cases you know when people just disappear when they're mm -hmm. missing or or when in cases like um there's been a boy missing in oregon for years and it, it most likely was his stepmother that did something to him but there's no evidence so gosh that would just be what happened to him yeah but if you could find the evidence to convict the stepmother that would be the best well i tell you this and and you're gonna think i'm weird but what i saw just now was a green barrel and that she put the body in a barrel of acid-like material it's like an oil drum and it's green it wouldn't surprise me wow he is and he's near a railroad yard if that helps hmm. So I hope that helps. Please let me know if anything results from that. Okay. Very cool. What is it that we do to people? How can people do this to people? I There's know. That teenager uh, around where I live, I'm down near Philly, that had a baby and buried it alive in the backyard. Didn't want her yeah. mother to know. Oh, Scared. my gosh. That's horrific. 
I know. I don't know what people are thinking nowadays. I do think we have too much crime on the television, and that's why I wrote Unlimited Realities, and that's why we're making it into a movie, to lift people's minds and consciousness up to transcendence, up to what you can really do with your life, and good things that you can bring in and be helpful for. Well, all of these people here are doing wonderful things. That is one thing that did concern me, Janice, you know, um, not about your books specifically, but just the the creative ideas that some people have. There was a movie, and I can't remember the name of it now, but um, right after that movie came out, I, I, I can't, oh, it was about in the subway station in New York, and they put the guy on fire, and then it happened in reality. And oh. so sometimes I go, why are you giving these, these you know, psychopaths these ideas to do these things that, you know, they're crying out to do? Um, that always kind of scared me a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I try to keep, there's, I keep the violence off, off, it's not my, there are some authors that are very graphic. Yeah. I'm never, um, I'm never graphic. But unfortunately, there's a lot of fodder out there. There's a lot of, there's so like the. Elizabeth just said there's just so much evil out there. It's it's kind of hard not to avoid it. It but, is. You know, um, I do believe that we are in the final days of living as we are. I think we are in what is called the last days in a sense that society needs to change. And we are having an astral battle between evil and the Lord. And that's not easy. Mm-hmm. But I think good's going to prevail. Good will prevail because good needs to prevail. Not. And there's lots of good people in this world, like Matt and Corey, who are from the earthgroup.org, who are doing amazing work feeding and schooling children around the world. Guys, you, you absolutely amaze me. And I know your parents must be so proud of you and your, and your fiancés and you're now your wife, Matt. And I know that I am proud. And so if you're out there and you want tea, coffee, or water, and you want to know that when you buy that coffee, you're going to send a child to school for five days and give them food in their bellies, especially girls who will get to go to school because they're going to bring food home after school, please go to the earthgroup.org and buy your food, your coffee, your tea, and your water from them. Janice Contori, fantastic novels. Um, I can't wait to read the first series. I read the last one. Now I got to go back and read all the other ones. But you are a terrific writer. And I'm so glad that you're experiencing a wonderful career. Uh, Second career, I should say. And go to JaniceCantori.com. And Elizabeth, uh, your, your book, Unlimited Realities, is on Amazon. It's fantastic. And we are out of time. So thank you, everybody, for being my guest today. I so appreciate having you. And... We will see you next week on Frankie Sense and more. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for joining. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. See you on the beat. Hit Rash Production. Turn the world.